On this week's show, we're going to talk about us writing our way into the business of being indie. With so many options and so many ways to succeed, has the term indie become something different? We'll discuss that and more with our roundtable discussion panel. Then, C.L. Cannon and the Indie Connection are along with a hypothesis of their own when it comes to finding you indie books to check out and fall in love with. But our love affair doesn't stop there, as we spend the final five minutes straight from the shores of the beautiful Galway and Erie River with David Green. So sit down, grab your coffee, and let's get to talking about all these issues and more. Here's your host for This Week in Indies, Joe Compton. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the show. It is This Week in Indies for March 20th, 2022. We've got an incredibly awesome show for you. I've got a great group here to talk a little bit about the term indie and uh, what that means in terms of has it changed has it evolved so we're going to go right to them and the round table and i'm really excited to have this group with us today look at this wonderful dais all right uh, welcome everybody thank you for joining us and uh let's go around the table and just uh, say hello and uh tell everybody where they can find you madeline why don't you start us off please Hey guys, I'm excited to be back and for the topic we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm an indie author, obviously. You can find all of my stuff here at my website and yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Gaffin. Uh, you can find all my stuff oops, over here, <laughs> over here at my website, CassieChronicles.com. I'm a science fiction author. I'm also an indie author and uh, yeah. Great to be back here with such wonderful fellow authors ready to talk about this topic. Awesome. All right, David? Hi, I'm David Green. Um, I'm a fantasy author predominantly, and uh, um, thanks for having me on the show. It's been a while since I've been on, so I'm happy to be back. And um, you can find me at davidgreenwriter.com. Awesome. All right, and Deborah? Hi, I'm Deborah Parmley. Uh, you can find my romance books here under deborahparmley.com and then i have another name deborah bishop which doesn't have a website yet um but i'm yes. writing uh <laughs> Chil children's and fantasy will be under deborah bishop which is my maiden name and i'm coming to you from my motorhome where i live full time and write so my author lifestyle is just a little different <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful like decorative this pieces there yeah, and everything you, yeah. you picked a nice spot to, to to broadcast from for us today oh thanks um and i have <laughs> a i finally have a ring light uh because the woodwork in here is it's beautiful but it makes it dark uh -huh. um, and if i open up the windows this particular coach most windows you can see through but they have a pattern on them that matches the the paint on the outside of the coach so nobody can see in. However, that makes it dark inside. So I've 
got a ring light now, so <laughs> now, now you awesome. can see me. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and we're happy that we can. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So, you know, um, this is this is kind of um, we're kind of doing this weird little series that we've come up with this this month. And it's kind of leading into now uh, kind of the term of indie. And uh, I wanted to talk to everybody a little bit because there's so much going on. You know, Sanderson uh, di drafted digital and, and, and smash words and all these things that are happening in our universe. And it's kind of uh, just interesting how things are evolving and changing and how people are kind of viewing indie, you know, some people, I've heard people talk about how it's kill, you know, it's going to kill the traditional publishing market, which is absolutely a, just acidine. But, uh, you know, other than that, uh, has has the term for you all evolved? Have you felt like it's changed since you started? I mean, we have all different types of people starting in all different types of timelines here. So I'm kind of curious if, if from the moment you you got into this where you were thinking what indie was to now has, has it evolved for you and how has that happened? Absolutely. A hundred percent. It's, um, you know, I, I got started putting stories up on Amazon. I think my first one went up back in 2011 and it really was the wild west. You know, it, it Looking back at some of the stuff I put up, it was not terribly good. The covers are amateurish. Um, now there there is a greater deal of professionalism. There are higher standards. Um, there are lots more authors. Yes, but I think that the indie community is, you know, it's much more vibrant now. There are many more people involved in the the ancillaries you know there are a lot of writers who do editing as well or formatting um there are so many more tools for you know for cover creation if you choose to do it yourself or you do a design or you get a designer so you have the access to all of the tools that traditional publishing would give you you know the editors the formatting the the designers um, it's just doing it yourself and choose and the author having actual control over it instead of, hey, this is the cover that we've chosen for your book. Uh, so, yeah, a huge difference, you know, in the 10 or 11 or 12 years it's been since I've been playing the sandbox. I haven't been in it as long as Adam, but just starting where I was trying to be a traditionally published author and then going the indie route, there is a lot less stress behind it. And I actually feel like a lot of newer authors are going to lean that direction just because it is so hard to get in with a traditional publisher now. And you almost have to have an agent just to even be looked at. So. Yeah. And. Uh, sorry, I was just going to expand on uh, Maddie's point, which is, you know, with the small press, that's a nice hybrid between the traditional and the, and the author, because the small press get, um, the small press have a lot more freedom to choose and say, okay, yeah, we're going to take a chance on this awesome author and this story because we like this story, not because we think it's going to sell 500,000 copies, you know, but we like this story and we think it'll sell enough to make our money back. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm with a small, I'm with a small press. Um, I went, I went that route. I'm probably out of everyone on the thing. I've probably been at this the shortest amount of time. I'd imagine it's been just over two years. Um, and I went with a small press because when I came into this, that was what, my understanding was what indie, indie was it was basically you had the uh the big five which is now the the big four and uh and which ones they owned and then everyone else so you had the independent presses you had the small presses and you had self-published writers um and i went that route because um <clears throat> i kind of looked into it and i kind of realized that you'd to get into this and to kind of make a splash i suppose is that you do need as a self-published writer you do need to have a little bit of capital behind you when you're starting off as adam was saying now with that level of covers that level of editing and formatting and then promoting the thing as well 
like you know unless you can do all of that yourself which i couldn't i i, I couldn't make myself a cover i i don't edit my own work. I can edit other people's work, but I can't edit my own because my brain fixes everything to say, this is what you meant, isn't it, when I'm reading it? And I'm like, yes, this is what I meant. It's perfect. And it never is. Um, so I had all these other things. So I was like, you know, the, the small press is is the, the way to go for me because, as again, like Adam and, and Maddie said, the control aspects of it is, is good to have as well because you can have that dialogue where it's like, well, you know, this cover that you've chosen isn't quite right for me. Uh, or this is the way I'd, I'd like this. And when you go to that step, when it's the agent and when it's the other editors and it's the publishers, editors and everything else, it kind of gets diluted. Um, I do a lot of interviews with other authors um, and I was talking to uh, an independent, a self-published uh, author called John Cronshaw recently. And he was saying that how, how he likes to look at it now is that instead of saying independent writers or self-published, he says, he calls it there's corporate publishing, which is the traditional way of doing it. And then there's everyone else. So he said, if you want to work with a corporation, you go and work with the corporation, get yourself the agent and do it that way. If you don't, then there's all the other options that are available for you. That's a good, yeah. good way to look yeah. at it. Yeah, that, that, yeah, I think that's, that's very exactly, well put. Exactly yeah. what it is. I've mm -hmm. been at this for a little while, as a lot of you know, but not at the indie part. Uh, I didn't put my first indie book out until 2013, and I did it with a book of poems because I wanted to test the indie avenue without investing too much of my romance books into it when I had the that traditional side working. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of like put the toe in it. Let's, let's take the big learning curve on, try create space, try putting it out there. Let's make your mistakes on this one. And uh, but my first uh, traditional book came out in 2017 in ebook and in 2008 in print uh, with a small independent press. There, there. Even back then, there was a lot of controversy about what is traditional and what is. And this is even predates the Big Five when there were a lot more publishers. And at the time. There were a lot of smaller houses that were still big, still corporate, but they weren't the big five. What you've got with the big five is a huge corporation with a lot of money, a lot of connections and setups in countries all around the world. A sales force that'll go knock on bookstore doors, catalogs to get your book out there. Your smaller corporation the one I started out with had 350 authors. My first book was edited by five editors before it came out. They had many uh, cover artists. So the level of what they could provide for me was pretty strong. I also had a plus going. I had the agent that sold my book picked me up after I was in a contest called the American title. And it was put on by Dorchester Publishing and Romantic Times Magazine. We were promoted before we had books out. People would vote online for the books. So some of what a big company can do for you, I mean, Dorchester Publishing was big. It was right up there with the big dogs. And uh, you can't really put a value on what they can give you promotionally if they'll promote you. There's always been three Big questions, no matter where you publish. If you look at a contract with a big house or anyone else, or you do your own, the first is distribution. Are they putting your book? The second, of course, is promotion. I'm going to say there's four, not three. The third is um, what media is it? You know, ebook, audiobook, print. None of, I can't, went on to be with five publishers total. A lot of, deadlines to juggle, but none of them put the books in audio. So that's an issue. What I, I didn't know at the time was an issue, was an issue. And then the biggest number four is how will they pay you? How much will they pay you? And will they pay you? Um, what made that little house traditional was it had a traditional boilerplate contract, seven years. Um, I had standard royalties. I had an advance was 
a small one, $100, but it was an advance, which means it was RWA recognized and considered a very good small house to be with. They never paid the advance. So, mm. so at the end of the day, it's like uh, Harlan, uh, gosh, what's his last name? Ellis, I think, says, mm. pay the writer. He's got a video about that. Pay the writer. <laughs> yeah. Harlan Ellis. <laughs> Please pay the writer. You know? <laughs> yeah, I uh, so to give everybody. I mean, I've told the story a hundred times here, but uh, to give everybody some context, in two thousand, uh, I was uh, I was I had an agent, and then we had a, had a deal in uh, with a medium press that was actually to Deborah's point backed by GE. So the, they actually were the people putting up the money for this press. And I got flown to Manhattan, got to go up in a 30 floor high rise and, and sit in a conference room table with, you know, beautiful mahogany and leather chairs and all of that. And uh, simply try to be groomed. And, uh, and then of course, threatened and everything else that happened with me and all of that. So yeah, that, that was back there, you know, before there was anything self-publishing was kind of this, you know, taboo thing at the point when this happened. And uh, this is kind of uh, predating all of that. And it's even predating Amazon at that point. And so there was a lot more, you know, it wasn't just big five. There was medium five. There was, you know, you know, low to medium five. And then there was, you know, the dogs and the, and the other alley cats that had to, you know, in the streets of New York that had to, you know, you know, scrounge on the scraps. And that was basically how it worked, much like how Hollywood works, where there is four big studios or three big studios, depending on who you ask. And, and then a bunch of little studios. So for me, the term indie has always been based upon that experience for me, which is the idea that anything that wasn't run by a corporate shill of, of a studio in Hollywood for movies was you were considered independent. You, if anything, if you made a movie that was less than $10 million, that was considered independent. I mean, uh, actually, it was really more like less than a million dollars, but uh, now it's $10 million, but uh, which is small. For anybody who doesn't know, that's a small budget for a movie. Uh, but uh, that, so that's always been my distinction with indie. So I've always considered small presses and anything that's not big five, like David said, not corporate uh, to be independent. And, you know, so, and, and the chat kind of agrees. That's a good distinction. And hello, everybody. Good morning to all these people. Let's say hello to all our friends out there, Margaret, Anita, Rebecca, Regine. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. But yeah. Uh, so for me, that's always been the distinction. So when I started this, I had the intention of it being, as long as you weren't with the big five or you weren't producing a movie with Brad Pitt at, at MGM, you were good to be on my show, you know? And, and even if you were producing a movie with Brad Pitt, and even if you were with the big five, I think the distinction there is that the thing that I think is the mythos about all that is even though you are with a big company, you still have to promote yourself. And you're independently promoting yourself regardless of what what contract you have, what money you have. I mean, it, you have to do that. And Sanderson is a good case in point there. I mean, the man has 330,000 followers on YouTube, you know, for a reason. He has, you know, because he's put himself out there as his brand and made mm -hmm. himself noticed. And he promoted yeah. himself. His publisher didn't put up the money to do that. And he didn't, you know, he didn't do any of that because Tor told him to. He did it because he wanted to do it. And mm -hmm. so, and of course, yeah, he was well established by the time he decided to do a YouTube channel. But he was doing it with purpose, you know, where he was putting out lectures and things like that that were 
for free. He was giving those things away. And so mm -hmm. he was promoting himself in that respect. So I'm kind of curious what, you know, has, has that because is it really the, the age of the internet that's changed everything? Has it been because of Amazon and because of you having to promote yourself social media wise that you really feel like indies evolved as a term? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, <clears throat> I think I think what it is is, um, I, I, in a way, it hasn't changed in 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 one aspect, but in a way, it has. There's just more access these days. I think whenever I remember a long time ago, uh, it seems like a long time ago, and it actually was when um, Harry Potter was first becoming a thing, and you know, especially being in the UK, J.K. Rowling was on talk shows and all this kind of stuff. They barely ever spoke about the books. All they wanted to know about was her story, you know, the, the, her, her, how she wrote it in a cafe, how she had to travel from Edinburgh to London all the time on the train, uh, and how she was a single parent and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> they were never really ever talking about the books. And that is kind of continued in that way. And, and now it's even with established authors like Brandon Sanderson, people want their work as well. But then they look at what we do in the indie sphere and all the things that we do when we go onto these kind of things and we're talking and, and we're doing quiz shows like Ron Lars quiz, quiz show that's coming on here soon. It's about us and people that are looking to buy books and looking to get into series from a new author that they don't, they don't know. A lot of times they want to know who that author is. They want to see, are they likable? Do they have anything in common with them? Um, how accessible they are to them? Because that's, I mean, that's a very important thing to readers. And you look at how popular TikTok is at the moment uh, for for readers and for um, using as a tool to promote um, the ones that go viral and the ones that tend to do really well are ones that have nothing to do with your book. They're about you as a person, or like your pet cat or dog, or something like that, or some, or, or you know, you're just doing something funny. And they seem to, uh, hi, hi Ron, <laughs> they seem to do really well because people are like, oh, this person, this is what this person is like, and then they pick up the work and look through it. Brandon Sanderson came around at the right time where the internet was, it had been around for a, for a time, but he really capitalized that. He was doing blogs, he was doing keeping up with his, um, he had word counters on his website where he was like, this is my project, I'm this percent up to it on the first draft. And then obviously when he took over Wheel of Time, that really exploded because he had, he had his beginning of his career and it was doing well. And then he added all of this big fan base to his his own one um so he worked hard at it and he obviously did and he had a plan but he also i don't want to say lucky because he i think did a really great job with wheel of time and i think he deserved it um but that doesn't happen to everyone they don't inherit this huge fan base that already exists but he definitely capitalized on that as well yeah for i think, I think for sanderson it was a perfect storm he, he had invested the time he had, you know, he had that fan base and he had the flexibility from his publisher, you know, to go off and do these four secret books. And so all of these things came together for him at this time, you know, based on what he had done and where he was and lightning struck. Now, could it happen again? Absolutely. Is this, you know, is this the, is this the model for, breaking traditional publishing no because if you look at what he did you know he had the career beforehand he had the wheel of, you know taking over the wheel of time coming through traditional publishing and so he had that huge fan base you know created that way and the fact that he's doing this independently is just okay yay for him fantastic for him it's not going to break traditional publishing let me address that for a minute. Every time I hear people talk about breaking traditional publishing, I just have to wonder what world they're living in because yeah, <laughs> if, they, if they really knew big publishing, they'd know, first of all, they have really deep pockets. They have really big lawyers. They have networking that's across the globe that's been in place for many, many years. There is no breaking big publishing. Now, if they do themselves in, that's one thing. But I don't see anything coming along that's going to break them. Now, something could come along that could compete heavily with them. But breaking them, no, I'm just kind of like, that's, 
that's a different that's wishful thinking on people's parts because yeah. i don't see that happening ever no no it's hyperbole <laughs> right. yeah i think the, i think the two main i think the two main things that this brandon sanderson thing really changes again it's not going to destroy in uh traditional publishing or anything but what it does is people with his clout like stephen king for example or you know, uh, charge Martin if he ever decided to do another series and finish his, his own one first or anything like that. If they decided, well, I have this work that is not under contract with anyone. I can, I have this fan base and I can lease it through Kickstarter or I'll do it this way and I will get the back end and I will get a bigger amount of money than I'll ever make through traditional publishing because I have these and the money's got, I've cut out the, the middleman. And that's the thing with Brandon Sanderson. I think his net worth was about six million, which is great. I wish I had six million net worth and he's, quadrupled that with his, kick, with his kickstarter right um but then it's only a certain amount of people that can do that and what that changes is that when they someone like him uh or Stephen king or whoever joe abercrombie or someone like that has this series that they've not sold to anyone they can go okay well what are my options now do i need to go traditional with this can i just do it myself and that's where it changes a little bit where the traditional publishers might be like well we need to change how we're doing our contracts and get first look agreements in with these people. So that might change. The other thing that changes as well is, and I was, I was reading this from the editor of Patrick Rofus's editor when uh, a couple of years ago, um, got talking about how, and she didn't mention Patrick Rofus. She was very, very careful not to mention his name, but it's, it, she was his editor. And talking about these authors that um, are constantly pushing back the deadlines for these series, like, game like a uh, song of ice and fire and king killer chronicles and saying that how um the traditional publishers can absorb that because they have the money and and and, and you know obviously the fans are upset and everything but it says what they what that does happen is that they change their budgets so if they're saying in like 2021 they're expecting a patrick rofus book to come out in march and then a george martin book to come out in september and then joe abercrombie book to come out in december that's their budget and then they say well we're going to make this amount of money and we can spend that to sign new authors and to promote newer authors and smaller authors and when they take that out of the equation and change the budget they can't rely on that to sign new authors anymore or give them bigger advances or promote them so if the likes of brandon sanderson and other people just decide you know what i'm done with traditional publishing now because i can do this for kickstarter all the time that is a huge part of the budget for these publishers gone they're going to find other people but they may not spend as much on other people as they were going to in the first place. Exactly. So what it does is it hurts the author. And then yeah. we're back to pay the author issues again. Um, so, you know, if the, big, if the big headliner authors start to do their own thing, that will hurt the smaller authors. And as far as promotion goes, within the bigger houses, what happens is, those headliners they get the promotional dollars they're going to send them on tour they're going to yeah. but that's even changed for them mark graney I, I follow him i like his books i read outside my my writing genres always um i notice when he he comes out with books they put him on interviews radio and video and, and all over the place and within two weeks he they've got him 20 different places so that should, that should tell authors listening why you need to do things like this and come mm -hmm. and talk to people. And it, and it also will tell you that there's not much money being put into that. I mean, when you do a radio interview or TV, I've done both. I don't have to pay for that. That's free promotion. But what you've got to do is you've got to convince them that you were talking to. Um, when it comes to the big houses, they just send their... Their PR people send a press release and the people flock to get them on the shows because they'll bring the readers. Mm -hmm. um, so in the in the bigger houses, those big names, uh, Mark Graney, he, he wrote Tom Clancy books. So we're talking big, big there. Um, it trickles down. You can get a little bit. If you're brand new, you're not going to get much. They're always thinking money into promotion though, but if you pay t close attention, you go to the big conventions like RT convention. I used to go to that one because I write romance. You'd see all of these really cool parties being thrown by the publishers. You'd go there and there's books on the tables. So yes, they're handing out books. 
they're getting them into readers hands they're promoting their authors but it's the uh i was the samhain publishing it's the samhain publishing party so they might hand out your book they're only going to hand out so many of them because they know if they hand out too many then they won't sell books at the book signing if you give this book away for free uh, Bobby Smith was one of my mentors. She was a big name rom uh, Western historical romance. She told me privately that the day that they did the Bobby Smith party and all a bunch of her books were out there. She didn't sell hardly any books at that book signing because mm. they knew they could go to the party and get the free books. So did that help her or hurt mm. her? I don't know. That remains to be seen. She had such a big readership. It's hard to gauge that. But to kind of give you her history, RT started the Mr. Romance pageant, which Fabio came out of. So we're talking, you know, big career making things happening there. Um, her publisher, Dorchester, sent her on a tour to the Walmarts with the first Mr. Romance, David Allen Johnson, and they signed books throughout the country. Now, that kind of thing is not available today because the big publishing houses want their authors to do more free stuff like Mark Graney does on the radio. Okay. So they're not putting the funds in like they used to. I don't see them sending anybody around the country with the cover art, uh, art guy, the, the model, you know, I don't see that happening today. If you go to a convention and you've got your, your, your model there, the authors usually had to pay for him to go. Mm. And it puts more burden on the author. So even the big houses aren't doing what they used to do. Um, but let me That's add one more, more thing. I don't want to sure. like over talk, but one more thing is that starting out like I did with that uh, contest, they called it the American title. Ten of us competed for one publishing contract with Dorchester. Every month, two of us would vote it off, you know, like American, you know, whatever you vote you off. Anyway, um, uh, none of us had books out. We didn't even have a book contract. We were brand new. And to be in the contest, you had to be brand new. Um, and, but they would pretty much vetted those books. If they said any of these 10, we will publish that vetted you. So then all the agents want you. And it builds this momentum. And it didn't cost me a dime. They're also promoting me all around the world. So I had people come into my website from Japan and Australia. And I was just like, this is so cool. I had to have a website. I didn't have a book out yet. I would advise authors to put your website out as you're writing your book because it helps build your readership. And um, so anyhow, I have all these, these readers that are coming to my, my site all the time. And then I get bumped. And I, it was a little bit of a time gap between that and getting the agent. And then a whole year to, for him to sell the book. And then a whole year later for the book to come out, I'm looking at a three year span that I have to somehow not lose those readers. I started doing author interviews once a week on Make Believe Monday's blog. Blogging was big back then. And I would keep some of my readers by having lots of authors come. So there's free things you can do and getting your name out there is important. But even the publishers would say that You've got to be out there. You can't hide in your writer cave. And the readers want to know about the author. There's a, a, if you're going to talk to a publisher about this kind of thing, you need to find out what exactly does their promotional promise bring. Is, is their promotion going to be their party at a site with your promo, your swag, with your books? Is it going to be their name your name or the book's name because those are three different kinds of promo so everything is not the same and some value has more value than other you know what i'm saying so there's a whole lot involved in that whole promotional thing but in general i would say get yourself out there now yes, well, yes. if you wait you're just shooting yourself in the foot Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll give yeah. I'll give the key element to how you will you could cripple the traditional publishing market. But I want to get Maddie in here because I know she's been itching to talk. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm going to so, be quiet for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so so take it take it, Maddie. It's all you. Well, I'm just going to kind of go off of what some of the stuff Deborah mentioned. Getting yourself out there is important, and as an indie author, it's extremely hard. Like 
Um, some of you guys know and have been on my show. I have a YouTube channel where I interview authors and I've started a blog like focusing on authors and it it's promotion is a big thing. And there's a big difference between being indie and traditional because yeah, they do pay for the publishing. But then again, do you know who they're like, what readers they're exactly reaching for? And as an indie, you can actually build more of a relationship with your readers and interact with them more because there's not that middleman. So I will. Uh, so I will tell you, if you want to know the impact of what Sanderson has done, it, it, this is the this is going to be the ultimate barometer for me, and that is the idea that if he takes a phone call from David Benioff, or he takes a phone call from Deborah Langs Langsley, or he takes a phone call from Ron Howard uh, directly, and they negotiate directly to buy the rights to his books to make into a TV series, or a streaming series, or a movie. That changes the entire game completely because that is where the traditional publishing market is really holding on to that money. The, they get they get more money from selling the rights to what you produce than any other stream of revenue that they can possibly come up with. That and the movies business and the television marketplace right now is the rights that everybody wants to negotiate and hold on to and no tradition. If you're going to go traditional publisher, you're not going to get any chance to have those rights because they know that's, that's the fruit off of the tree that is going to make them keep their Mercedes, keep their penthouse and all of those things, because that is, that's the game changer right there. When, when Benioff picks up the phone and calls the author directly, it's over. It, 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 that changes everything and the traditional marketplace will have to then pivot. And what you were saying, Deborah, will probably be where they pivot. They'll probably start putting those tours back together because this is the interesting thing that I wanted to kind of circle around to. And we'll get to this toward, I mean, I wanted to get this more toward the end, but we're in, in the space now. So, and that is regardless of all of the things that have changed the industry, the internet and all of that. The way we sell books is still the traditional model it's always been. And Deborah mentioned that blogging was a thing. Well, blogging is a thing again. Newsletters are a thing again. Newsletters go and they come. Blogging comes and they go. Having a website, not having a website comes and it goes. But ultimately, it always comes back into fashion. Why? Because it works. Going to conventions and meeting your fans face to face and handing them a physical copy works. That's where you make your money as an author because it works. It, it's, it, it's proven. It's a proven formula that'll never not work. And it may, may wean it. Something else may work a little bit better than something else. And you as a person may work better doing it this way or that way. But that is the key factor is it all comes back into fashion. And that's why these things kind of all go in a circle like that, right? So mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious to everybody's thoughts on that aspect of it. That makes a lot of sense, actually. It's like what you said with it being the connections. And like I mentioned, having that relationship with the readers, I feel is very, very important because even if they don't like your genre genre and they meet you, they're still going to be hopefully be supportive and be like, hey, I'm going to buy this person's book because they're awesome, you know? Yeah, the 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 in person thing, and and then this is the weird thing becoming a writer during a pandemic because I only kind of managed to do it once, uh, and it was the end of last year, and I was a bit tentative doing it. So instead of getting my own table, I get like I got I got like the uh, the the group table, and I was just like lurking around a little bit because like I'm not sure if I'm going to sit here behind the table yet because I'm too shy to do this. But next time I will because it is the perfect storm of everything that we do. You know, all of this kind of stuff uh social media and all that just being there sat there face to face with your books in front of you talking to people and talking about anything and then maybe as as uh, maddie said them going you know what you're 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 all right i like you i'm gonna try one of your books and then um, you'll always have that fan then if, if they like it because they'll be like oh yeah i met this author he signed it they personalized it for me um i had a chat with them and they were cool i'll see them again next year or whenever it is 
and that's like you know it's a it's the old-fashioned way of doing business i suppose face to face but it does make that connection and that's what we're all trying to do online is to make a connection with people uh to stand out against everyone else that's doing it as well or not against everyone but with everyone else i suppose and and, and be part of this movement and face to face is the thing that that beats all of that and it puts and and this goes back to the difference between indie and corporate is it puts the author back in control you know we choose which conventions we go to and you know even down to the people walking up to your table you know you're choosing who you're interacting with and how you're interacting with them um you're choosing whether to do the newsletter once a week once every month you know, uh, you're choosing whether to have a website which has all the bells and whistles or is just a simple landing page. You're choosing which platforms to interact on. You know, it, it again, it's going back to the author has control over what they're doing. I couldn't do what I'm doing today if I had not made the move from traditional to hybrid to indie because the way traditional set up with the deadlines and the timing and the spacing, you've got to have things at a certain time. And although a couple of times in my life, I've had to invoke the, the drop dead deadline, which some people don't know about, but you get your deadline and then you get the absolute worst case scenario. My, my father passed and I had to just put everything on hold because he was on hospice for eight months. And then that was a rough year. And, even the big publishers understand that to a degree. But what I'm doing now where I live in a motor home, I don't always have good internet. I'm going to be in a different city in about a week. And then two weeks later in a different city. And so my address changes if I'm receiving a real thing in the mail that's not going to the P.O. box that scans my mail and emails it to me. Um, that would be really tough if I was still traditional, um, they, they don't like things outside the box they, because they're in control. In fact, the word itself, indie, independent, when you're traditional, there is no independent anything. You've got no control over your cover. When your book comes out, where it's distributed, all of these things, everything lives and dies by the contract. So, to me, it's they'll even tell connected. you what tweet to take down. They'll tell you if you tweet oh, something that yeah. they don't like, they'll tell you to yes. take it down. Yes, and there's I forget what the clause is because it's been a very long time since I looked at a, at a traditional contract, but there's even something in there about how you live your life. You know, you've got you're gonna mm -hmm. be you can't go out there and act like a crazy person, obviously, but you know what I'm <laughs> saying. They have a thing in there like they used to do with yeah. the actors. Where yeah, you, yeah. you did not have control. They had the control. And your name. I've met authors who can't write under their name because it was sewed up in her contract. Well, I would say, well, then write under a different name. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. I, I don't do well with that whole control issue. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. The, yeah. <laughs> oh, just the control thing. And, and this is, you know, authors can have it when they deal with traditional publishers. But you have to fight for it. One of my favorite stories, um, James Artemis Owen, the Here, Here There Be Dragons. And mm. So he was trying to sell the first book in the series. And I won't name the publishing company, but they said they put a big pile of money in front of him and said, OK, here you go. We'll do this, um, but we get to choose the cover. Now, if you know anything about James, he's an amazing artist. He does all of the, you know, he got started doing comics and doing, doing illustration. And he just said, I can't do my own cover. They said, no, you can't, do, you know, we, we don't let anybody do the, their own cover. He walked away from a pile of money. He signed it with another, you know, another company that said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll let you do your cover. And that's the cover that was on the, on the book in something like 21 out of 22 countries. Um, so he, it was a very smart move because he created some great branding because anywhere you went, you saw the same cover, the same art. Um, but he fought for the control and he walked away from a pile of money and they kept chasing him saying to saying to his agent, Hey, what's, you know, 
what's the number? What's the real number? Right. What does he actually want? And what's the agent, price? James yeah. kept saying, for us to have total control, what's your price? Yeah, I want yeah. control. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I want my art on my book. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. How well, stupid is that? How, stu how stupid is that publishing company? That's the one <laughs> cover they don't have to pay for for right. Christ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it, I mean it was a ridiculously stupid move on their part. Like I said, I'm not naming the company. I love this story, by the way. I've heard the story before. Yeah, that's a great story. I love it is. It. it is a fantastic story. But you, <laughs> I mean, even dealing with the traditionals, you can rest control. You just have to dig in your heels and say, yeah. "No, this is the line I'm not going to cross." Sure. And get it in writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing with the traditional ones as well is that obviously they have like, you know, if, if they like your work and they're going to promote it, it, it gives you a much bigger scope than what, unless we're, we've got thousands and thousands of, of dollars or pounds behind us or euros in my case, um, that we're not going to be able to do. But the, the, the flip side to them as well is is there's no... There's no loyalty there. It's all business, right? And I, I know an author who is traditionally published and is an, an amazing fancy author. And I won't mention her name because, um, but I'm sure you, I'm sure people have heard about this anyway. Um, her books, um, a trilogy was traditionally published, really, really um, well received critically, um, and didn't do so well sales wise, uh, and not to what the publisher thought that they would have, what they wanted basically, and uh as she was working on a, a new series and submitted it to the agent and they had this a first look um contract with the, with the publisher the publisher decided that no they're not going to publish any more of her work and dropped her basically and that is a big change though because they, they are uh used to that mo mode of publishing that is what they're used to that's how they work but the thing is once you are dropped by one of these publishers then it's very hard to get picked up by another publisher because they're like well you know what you've been dropped because your books didn't sell as well as this publisher thought so they have to then kind of look at it and go well well do i go independent do i go self-publishing do i do this route and that is for someone it's a, it's a culture shock right because for people like us that have i mean uh, deborah would know because you've worked with all all this kind of different this way but if you're used to working in one certain way and then suddenly that's the only avenue available to you it's it's and and because the books didn't sell so well they don't have that audience base to pull back on either like it's it's one of those things where it's almost you have to start again and that happens quite a lot to a lot of authors you, you see some that just go missing for a while and then a new book suddenly appears and you're like oh, what happened to this person <laughs> right and that's it it's, yeah. they've been in the wilderness for years because of it at the end of the day, though, it's about you, the story, and the reader. And uh, I'll just tell you one quick story about the power of a bookmark. Okay, so I hadn't, my book wasn't out yet, but I had my bookmarks, so I had my promotional materials, and I was selling some furniture, and this lady came and bought a piece of furniture from me. And so I told her about my book and gave her my bookmark. Several years later, I got invited to, uh, I was in uh, Memphis, and just, about an hour and a half away in Mississippi, a library was doing their first author day, author reader day. I was invited to go and represent romance and take my books there. So, and I said, yes, of course. And, and uh, so I asked the librarian after I arrived, I said, you know, how did you find me? She said, one of our patrons came in with a bookmark and said, if you're doing this author day, I want you to invite this woman. And I thought, holy cow one bookmark years ago, didn't even have a book out yet. And look what that did. So never discount. If you're sitting at a book signing and they're not buying the books there, they might be taking that bookmark home. They might be buying an ebook. They might buy your book a whole six months later because their budget didn't allow it until then. They might tell their library, order the book and they might get you invited to the first author event. So it's always you and the reader, brick by brick, you build your house. That's awesome. You know, um, we have some great comments that I want to address too and bring in here, uh, but uh, you, you know what else you need to, to focus on is that we have some great indie books. If you, if you are a fan of traditionally published authors, we do this every single week where we have an incredible array of authors that you can find based on certain traditionally published books, 
from our friend CL Cannon and the Indie Connection. And then we'll be back to address some comments and talk about the the end, uh, you know, about indie more. So, all right, here we go. <laughs> CL Cannon here from Fiction Atlas Press bringing you another indie connection. Today I'm going to be telling you about some indie books that you might enjoy if you're a fan of The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. The first book I have for you is called The One Month Boyfriend by Roxy Noir. It's a simple enough agreement. For one month, Silas Flynn is my boyfriend of convenience. He needs his old-fashioned boss to think he's ready to settle down. I need some arm candy to prove to my jerk ex-fiancé that I've moved on. Perfect, right? Except for one minor detail. We can't stand each other. Everybody thinks he's the perfect guy, but I know the real Silas. He's a cocky, obnoxious jerk who thinks he can charm his way out of trouble and get anything he wants. But there's one tiny problem with fake dating. It looks a lot like real dating. Worse, it feels a lot like real dating. I know once this is over, we'll go our separate ways. No matter the smoldering looks he gives me, the possessive way he touches me, or the dirty things he whispers in my ear, Silas isn't falling for me. That's fine. No matter how good being with him feels, I'm not falling for him either. One month. That's it. The second book I have for you is called The Confetti Pact by Michelle Gorman. She wants a groom. He wants a visa. When London's rising social media star Nellie Roberts is left in the lurch with not just a wedding, but also the country's biggest magazine feature on the line, she's got no choice but to substitute one groom for another. Luckily, she meets Raphael, who's looking for a way to stay in the UK, where he's built the life he loves. So they make a pact. Act the perfect couple for as long as it takes for Nellie to get her wedding and Raphael to get his visa. The catch? Absolutely nobody can know the truth. With the magazine following their every move, Nellie's ex re-emerges with a change of heart just as her pretend feelings for Raphael start to be anything but pretend. What could possibly go wrong? The third book I have for you is called Make a Scene by Mimi Grace. Faking this relationship should be a piece of cake. Retta Majors is having a bad day. But that's to be expected when your ex gets engaged to your cousin. Instead of totally freaking out, Retta decides to attend the wedding with her amazing, faithful, and handsome boyfriend. One problem. He doesn't exist. Duncan Gilmore is living his dream. His boxing gym is open for business, and he's focused on success. The last thing on his mind is a relationship. That is, until the beautiful baker next door makes him an offer so bizarre he can't refuse. One weekend of pretending to be Rada's boyfriend should be easy. However, shared kisses and some flirting starts to blur the lines in their fake relationship. When their performance draws to a close, will they go their separate ways or return for an encore? And the last book I have for you is called It Was All the Pie's Fault by Elizabeth Safflor. Chloe believes in two things. Russell is her soulmate and her pies are magic. One bite of her cherry pie and he'll declare her the one. Jaded attorney Nick doesn't believe in magic or Russell's intentions with Chloe. Pie making wishes come true, but she's perfect for him as a fake girlfriend to appease his family friendly boss. She's in love with someone else after all, and he doesn't do love, especially not with someone so bubbly, so dewy eyed, so committed to marching down a wedding aisle. Plus, this girl needs some help when it comes to men. A lot of it. He'll help her lure Russell into dreaded wedded bliss, and she'll pose as his date. Except Chloe's wishes begin to go haywire, granting nicks and turning all those fake kisses into smoking hot moments of passion. It turns out Chloe's not as innocent as he first thought. Okay, that's all for me this week. I'll see you next week on the Indie Connection. Bye! As always, uh, thanks to CL Cannon for, you know, what's really interesting about this week's thing that I noticed is um, 
Uh, I always mention how the covers are really great on this, but the blurbs were fantastic this yeah. week on these books. Uh, the, I just was like, I was chuckling the whole time. Uh, what a what uh, romance! I, I, you know, I used to not think romance was anything, but man, I am so wrong because that, that those are those are so. I would read any of those books just based on the blurb, and you can too. You can go right now and well, don't go right now. Wait, wait another twenty minutes, but. Go back and check, check out the <laughs> links there, and and have everybody uh, everybody's books are there, and and all the links for everybody here. So uh, go definitely go buy some books today and, and check it out because that, that's how you help us indies do the things. Uh, but I wanted to look at the comments section here because there's a lot of great comments here, and uh, and uh, Karina, I know you have a really great comment. I want to save that for that the one comment that I saw from you to the end, uh, because I think it's the perfect mic drop. But uh, Rebecca says here that most of the, the stuff she's been trying to beat into her author's heads. For those who don't know, Rebecca runs Three Furious Press, a small press. Uh, that, of course, is my publisher. So I, I have to say that. <laughs> uh, just in the matter of fairness and disclosure. Mm -hmm. so Transparency. It, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Yes. The ones that have followed my advice have done really well for themselves. So, you know, and then Karina says, even with a trad, you're still expected to do all the marketing and promotion. It's up to you to find the followers, likes and subs. And I'll add to this. And I think everybody here would probably agree that if you were going for traditional nowadays, even I mean, even back then, they asked this question, but not not to the extent it is now on the on the questionnaire or the you know whatever and your agent will even ask you this how many followers do you have on social media how many that's a that's a that's a legitimate question they ask and they're and they're and that's a really important aspect of becoming a traditionally published author now is they they want to know that you have a built-in following like deborah was saying get your website up get your followers up and all that and then uh the Karina says, I leave my business card in all the female toilets in the cafe and restaurants I go to. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Pokey and Phil with a big heavy stick. <laughs> yes, I know I'm very bad at promoting myself, possibly. You know, you weren't overt or anything about that. You've gotten right. better. You've gotten better. Thank you. Thank you. But anyway, so. Yeah, so I wanted to go through those comments, and uh, yeah, there's one I'm saving for the end there, but uh, uh, I'm just kind of curious how everybody. Oh, there's our fifth author running. <laughs> the wonderful. <laughs> uh, if he has any thoughts, we'd love to hear them as well. Uh, here he comes. <laughs> he <heard>. special guest <laughs> appearance. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, to kind of wrap this all up and kind of put it in a nice, neat little bow on it, uh, kind of give me your thoughts about where you see indie going. Do you feel like it, this is an ever-evolving term that we're all going to, uh, ever-evolving position we're all going to be in? Do you feel like there's an opportunity or possibility that this becomes more moves more toward the centrist hybrid idea is it already kind of already there or do you feel like that we're going to meet in the middle between traditional or is it going to be a war between indie and traditional at some point i mean we can't obviously compete on that level but as deborah said deep pockets deep pockets right but but is is where, where is the evolution in your mind and do you feel like this is an ever evolving idea being independent? Yeah, I, I think so. Go, go on, Adam. Go, go. Uh, I think <laughs> so it's going to be absolutely. I, I think it is. It is absolutely going to keep evolving. Uh, which direction it's going to go? I ha I'm sorry. I, I don't have ESP. I, I don't even have ESPN. Um, <laughs> and and so we're just going to have to keep evolving with it. You know, we're going to have to grab onto what works. And when that stops working, we're going to have to find the next thing that works. I don't think it's ever going to come to a war between indies and traditionals because there are too many people on the planet looking for books, looking for things to read, for 
traditionals to wipe out indies or indies to wipe out traditionals. So it's, you know, it's just going to be, it's going to change. And so we're going to have to be flexible and change with it and learn from, you know, learn from each other and learn from, you know, take the best practices from wherever we can find them. It's a good point. So. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's such a gone gone, Deborah. I, oh, I, I think when the, the whole subject of a war between the two comes up, it kind of reminds me of when I actually when I first came and did things with you, Joe, on Go Indie Now. I had traditional authors saying, Deborah, what are you doing? First of all, you write romance. Second of all, you're a hybrid. And I said, Why wouldn't I? This makes no sense. This is not an us versus them. Authors need to stop thinking of us versus them because we all win when we all rise, right? If we're divided, we do not win. And this allows any big entity, corporation, to have more control. So we want to keep as much control as we can as authors over our rights. Watch what the big guys are doing, not what they say. My grandma used to say says and does are two different things. What are they doing? What rights will they let you have? They don't want you to have electronic rights. They don't want you to have, they're going to sew up all the rights. What's going to come down the road tech wise that's going to change the books, the way they're formatted? Uh, will they be interactive? Will we have instead of audio book with one or two people narrating, will we have a whole cast? Will it be AI? There's so many things that could come down the road that can just flip and change everything. And if there's one thing I do know after being a dinosaur in this for a little bit, you know, uh, it's that things can turn on a dime and you've got to be ready to adapt and adjust. Your biggest tool in your toolbox is the ability to do that in the publishing world. And I would never refer to you as a dinosaur. I would refer to you <laughs> as royalty. Oh, well, thank you, Joe. Gosh. <laughs> All right, David, you want to jump um, in? Yeah, I think I think it comes down to a lot of it as well as, as genre. Um, I think there's going to and, and and also um, the type of books that people buy in in certain times of the year. And what about what I mean by that is that there's always going to be a place for where James Patterson and Jeffrey Archer and Lee Child books are sold. And that's always going to be predominantly in a store because people buy them for gifts and they buy them at Christmas or at birthdays. And I think that's not going to change all that much. And it's and that's because more of the brand than anything and the sort of people that they are marketed to um, are people that generally just buy them for gifts. Um, and it's the only books that they read. Everything else, and, and more for what we're concerned with, <clears throat> the genre sort of stuff, speculative fiction and and even romance, I think that is something that is ever going to be changing and that you have to be in front of. And I think what is going to maybe change about that is that you're going to get a lot of people. And I wonder how agents are going to play into this because I think agents will obviously still want to get involved in it, especially if they're cutting out the middleman in terms of like, you know, a publisher and, and going self-publishing or going through through crowd crowdfunding and what have you because there's a big piece of the pie to take for an agent there. Is um, You're going to get a lot more people that are going to, really kind of study the market and think, well, what is the right thing for me? And a lot of these people that are just coming into it that have got a manuscript that, that they're looking to do might go with a small press first or an independent press just to get that entry level into the world to see how it all works. They can start building up their audience. And then when they start getting big enough or, or bigger, it might be, well, you know, do I do this on my own? Do I, do I have a following that can sustain me? And what you might get then is, a big change in how Deborah was talking about is how contracts work with the traditional ones. They'll be looking to tie people down for longer and longer contracts and looking at not just this book or this series, but the next series that they're going to do and, and so on and so forth. Whereas authors will then be pushing for shorter contracts and less control because they can say, well, you know what? I can take this somewhere else or I can do this myself if I need to. So that is where it's going to be a, a very interesting thing to look at is um how savvy people are going to get with it and how publishers the traditional or corporate publishers are going to react to authors putting the foot down and saying no i can take this elsewhere or no i just want this one book and i will see what i do with the second one and so on and so forth 
Maddie, did you want to add to this? No, you guys covered it really well. Because that, that's why I'm sitting over here, like nodding my head. Not that y'all can see me on the screen. But I was like, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's it. I think, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll drop we'll mic drop it with this, and uh, I think this sums it all up. Why and why would you give a piece of the pie if your pie isn't big enough, right? So you know, uh, and even if it is big enough. Why wouldn't you want to eat it all, right? I mean, that's basically what Sanderson has done. He's got a big ass pie, and he's like, you know what? I want more of this pie. I'm always left feeling hungry after after <laughs> this, right? So, you know, and uh, looks and, you know and, and I don't, I don't know. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> what my dad used to say is, everything is better with pie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. made me think of that. That was that was better than what I was gonna say, so I'm just gonna leave it there. So <laughs> Thanks, but that, <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. And everything is better with pie. Yeah. Uh or cake. I'm not gonna debate if you like cake <laughs> over pie, I'm hey, we're all inclusive here. Everybody, <laughs> as Deborah said, we need to stop warring, we need to stop fighting yeah. and just in, embrace us all cake and pie lovers um plenty are welcome here all right so everybody can you can commiserate in one spot you know mm -hmm. all right so uh deborah why don't you tell everybody where they can find you please okay you can find me at deborahparmley.com uh you can also find me i do a a travel blog a beautiful day traveler and I have a YouTube, Beautiful Day Traveler, where I'm going to be doing a lot more videos and stuff about where we go and what we do. And I'll try and show more of the writing life part of that along with the, nice. what we're doing. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, look forward to that. All right, Adam, tell everybody where they can find you, sir. So you can find me at CassidyChronicles.com. I'm on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Um, you can find the books on Amazon and Joe, I'm going to share that cover with you again. Nice. This is the book that's coming out in June. This is uh, a, a new branch of my Cassidy Chronicles, and I'm very excited for it. Drops June 20th, and uh, yeah, go take a look at it. Awesome. Nice cover. All right. Yes, it's gorgeous. I love it. it. Yes. All right, Madeline, tell everybody where they can find you, please. All right, guys. <laughs> right. You can find me and my books. These are just a few of them. I have quite a few um, on my website down here. So, and I'm published widely. So, hop on my website again and pick your favorite bookstore and check out my work. So, yeah. Just you me. know, one thing you're not very good at promoting there, Miss <laughs> Madeline Dale, is. The YouTube channel you keep referencing. Everybody. Yes. Tell everybody about your YouTube channel a little bit. Well, you can also check Hi. out some author interviews. Hold on, bud. Hi. On my YouTube channel, Mommy. which the link is Mommy. on there as well. Mommy. So, yeah. Mommy. All right. And this is my future author. Mommy. Mommy. My <laughs> That's Harrison, everybody. Look out for Harrison Dale. He's going to, he's going to take the world by storm. He's the next big thing in indie <laughs> publishing for sure but uh i'm joe compton this is go indie now and yes i am an author i wrote some books go check them out just uh, we the moral majority amongst the killing go there you go all right i promote it Did, are you happy now rebecca i hope you are but uh that being said uh this is go indie now uh if you're here for the first time congratulations you found us thank you so much for being here thank you for hanging out for, for this incredibly great conversation that we just had and i hope you come and check out more of the great conversations we have and all the things that we're doing uh and you can do that by hitting the little subscribe button there hitting the little bell notification and you can smash that like button right now that would be really awesome if you did that comment and share and do all those wonderful things tell more people about us we really appreciate all of that and that being said we uh it's time for me to stop yapping and to bring the last five minutes to the one the only the man across the pond <laughs> mr david green it's, it's all yours sir take it away thank you very much the big the big pond um it's funny that Americans say it has to pond for America because we say that for the UK and it is literally a, a pond compared to the Atlantic. But anyway, enough of that. Thanks very much for giving me the last five minutes. 
Um, I am going to give you a little reading from this book, which is uh, my urban fantasy um, series called The Devil Walks in Blood. The series is called Hell in Haven. Um, so this is the special edition of this book. I've never read from it before in this thing. I usually read from this one, which is my uh, first of my epic fantasy series, but I thought I'd do a little bit of a change um, because I'm actually writing the next one for this at the moment. So I'm kind of in the mood to kind of keep my, my head space in it. So the series is called Helen Haven and this is the special edition. It's actually, I released a small novelette first called Dead Man Walking before this one. And this version has Dead Man Walking and the sequel, The Devil Walks in Blood together because um the second book picks up in the same scene as the last book the first book ends so it's it's just it's nice to put them in there and there's quite a lot of ties between the story so i'll read the blurb and um a little bit of the the first chapter of the, the second book so special edition including books one and two hell is real we're all living it nick holleran learned the truth the hard way the day he took three bullets to the chest and bled out in an alleyway. Only death didn't stick, and it's been five long years working among the ghosts, monsters, demons, and fallen angels, hoping that next time he'll make it into heaven. But things are never that simple, are they? After a night from hell, private investigator Nick Holleran finds himself face to face with Diana, the mystery ghost from his office, and a job that he can't say no to. With unseen evils on his heels and a dead girl at his side, Nick uncovers horrific truths that put him at odds with the Haven Police Department and even closer to death than ever before. Nick will soon realise the devil isn't the only one that walks in blood. So the premise of this of this world is basically uh, the main character, Nick, Nick Holleran, uh, dies in the first line of the first book. And before his spirit goes to heaven, which he sees and is like, heaven is real, um, he is resuscitated and after he's recuperated in hospital and surgeries he realizes that hell is also real and we are living in hell humans alongside everything that you can imagine only that we can't see them so he tries to figure out um why the world is this way while taking on jobs for humans and creatures and anything else alike so here's the the start of the first chapter so in the last chapter the last book there's a ghost in his corn in the corner of the office that has been facing the wall for five years and as the book ends she turns around and says i've got a case for you i want you to find out who murdered me and this is the first line a case i mutter my cigarette flutters from my lips to the floor smoke tendrils drifting upwards i can't see myself I'm glad the eyeless ghost girl who stood in the corner of my office for the last five years can't either. At least, I think she can't. Reckon I must look as surprised as a fish that got the hook in the wrong end. A fucking case? You aren't so much as twist, twist, twitched for five years, and now you're offering me a job? How are you even going to pay? It isn't my best quip, but under the circumstances. She cocks her head to the side, twisting around until she's facing my laptop. Can you turn that racket off? I blink. Nirvana's Stay Awake plays on a low volume, I might add, and my fingers feel thick as I hit pause. What? You don't like my music? Is that what you call it? I prefer a little bit, a little more melody in mine. Don't you have any Beatles records? Records? I ask, glancing at Spotify. Wait, what the hell are we talking about? I don't even know your name. It's Diana. Not Darcy, the name I gave her. I'm actually kind of disappointed. Close enough, I guess. Okay, so why is it taking you five years to speak to me? I tried, you know, more than once. She turns her sockets on me and my blood chills a few degrees. It's like those eyeless pits pin me to the chair. They see everything, I'm sure of that. The analytical part of my brain fights its way to the surface as I study her. With her eyes missing and her black skin now grey, washed out like all ghosts, it's hard to place an age on her, but I'd guess no more than 16, max. Her long pigtail hair runs down to her waist, and she's wearing a striped one-piece dress that stops just above her knees. She's not from this decade, the 1960s if that comment about the Beatles records is any indicator. I lean back in my chair, waiting for her to answer. She could have stood in that corner for 60 years if I'm right. A life sentence for a victim. And I will leave it there, because I think the time is up. Joe may return, or he may not.
the magical words, sir? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, I I forgot the magical words. One second. Uh, <laughs> um, I will I will waste it's some more time. It's always time to go indie now. It's always time to go indie now. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.